Wow. Thank you so much for that um, awesome introduction. It's, it's really such an honor to be here. Um, I've never been to Colorado. I've never been to Boulder. Had an amazing day today. Um, in my short visit, I've had a chance to visit studio, some studio work this morning at SYNC. Um, had this great discussion with some of the faculty on the studio culture issues that we're kind of trying to tackle now. Had a great meeting, discussion with uh, Will Schrober, an architectural engineer in here, I'm sure some of you know. Um, so again, in this short period of time, uh, have witnessed and kind of been exposed to uh, the great work, uh, kind of research, the academic work, and just the general um, environment and vibe here, which is really so inspiring. So um, it's really a sincere pleasure to be here, and especially to be a part of this esteemed lecture series tonight. Um, so, for the lecture kind of title, I'll address this uh, title of the talk, which is Hybrid Reality Design, Bioresponsiveness in the Built Environment, through the lens of ongoing design research at my lab, which is the Interactive Design and Visualization Lab, which is exploring new methods and tools for the design of sustainable, healthy, and socially engaging built environments. So before I go into explaining the kind of meaning of hybrid reality design, I first want to clarify what I mean by this, this word bioresponsiveness. So I, de I define the term bioresponsive as a kind of architectural, a spatial, or a technical response to both external energy flows, bioclimatic energy flows, but also to kind of internal, biological, human uh, preferences, needs, and desires. So in other words, the goal is not only to design an adaptive system or a building or even a city that's kind of purely in response to its environment, but rather to design ways that it can respond or adapt to both dynamic energy flows and to the unpredictable human behaviors of, of occupants. So my, while much of my work you'll see uh, values and incorporates energy modeling and simulation software into the process, I approach the integration of these tools with a kind of productive skepticism. So my overall objective is not to kind of purely rely on the computational tools for performance optimization, but rather to weave in qualitative architectural criteria that encompasses broader and sometimes messier um, kind of social or ecological values. So to kind of further frame the argument or the issues that I'm address addressing in this field of environmental and high performance design, I argue that a lot of the kind of current discussion around sustainable building technologies is uh, in some ways too focused on achieving quantitative benchmarks while kind of overlooking these complex relationships between people and their environment. And also the kind of tensions between individual and collective desires or preferences for things like comfort or views. And a lot of this, um, I argue, is also part of the way that we work when we're, say, developing a new technology or a new system, which is often through these kind of isolated experimental processes that tend to focus uh, on a kind of single scale, at one, one scale at a time, and, and sometimes lack the kind of critical input from users of these systems or spaces. So my overall approach to the, to the research and to design in general is to fuse these ecological criteria through research processes that embody bioresponsiveness and design. And this is achieved through new hybrid reality design environments that enable designers and the kind of users, the building occupants, to engage in both the kind of discourse and the development of environmentally um, high performance systems and buildings and cities. So more specifically, I'm developing simulation software that merges contemporary techniques for energy modeling with new visualization methods so we can facilitate this integration of energy feedback into the architectural design process in a, in a more seamless way. So the broader aim of all of this is to make manifest the energy implications of design choices for both disciplinary and non-disciplinary audiences. So not only for architects or for people who are you know, involved in, in the, desi the design of the built environment, um, but even to other disciplines or maybe people who uh, kind of are everyday users. 
So to do this, I'm operating uh, across kind of two spectra. The first is scale, and the second is reality. So in terms of scale, this ranges from the investigation of new materials for building envelope system design to the visualization and the analysis and design um, at the kind of community or the urban scale. And in terms of reality, I'm experimenting across the spectrum through physical prototypes to augmented reality simulations to virtual reality environments. So what we get in the end is a kind of hybrid of these scales and mixed reality systems into a kind of hybrid reality, hybrid reality design process. So to kind of frame uh, the approach in a way, uh, there are a few interdependent research scopes that, that sort of shape this process. One focuses on a design methodology or the kind of development of these simulation frameworks that both visualize and measure the performance of the systems. The second involves the actual system development, or say the design of a building envelope technology. And the third is the integration of these methods and materials into architectural test beds. It could be prototypes, it could be building proposals, um, and it could be uh, kind of community scale planning. What I find that's really uh, incredibly productive and inspiring about this approach is that it creates a kind of re reiterative co-design process where the computational work or the kind of virtual design frameworks that I'm, that I'm working in, these, these things incorporate these sort of messy variables and parameters that deal with human preferences and desires, uh, subjective preferences for aesthetics, things like that. Um, and we're, we're using those with the objective parameters that might relate more to energy performance and metrics of, of kind of building carbon footprint. These kind of things are actually really interestingly informing the physical experiments. And then these physical experiments are equally informing the computational frameworks. So it's really important that at, at, at some level we're engaging in both of these simultaneously um, so that we can allow this kind of code design process to emerge. And the current research that we're, we're working on utilizes a synthetic approach where we're kind of coupling physical systems like the material experiments with new simulation tools at the building envelope and the urban scales. So a lot of this collaborative work takes place at this interactive design and visualization lab, which is located at, uh, it's off campus, but just downtown Syracuse in this building here, which is the Syracuse Center of Excellence. And this building is kind of a, it's, it's, a, it's this sort of research headquarters, it's a living uh, lab test bed for, for advanced building technologies and systems where we're testing things out, uh, you know, human factors testing, putting win new window systems on the facade. So a lot, of, a lot is going on at this lab. And so uh, with my collaborators and our team, our mode of operation is really to utilize this sort of hub and bring in the architects, the engineers, artists, scientists, um, a lot of different disciplines into the same space so we can sort of collectively rethink how emerging materials and systems can radically improve design research and practice. And one which really simultaneously enriches cultural meaning while also improving the energy performance of the environment. So this is a, a kind of diagram of, of what is inside the lab, this particular lab space. Um, we, we kind of constructed this in 2014 as a space for testing these mixed reality systems at different scales. So here with um, Amber Bartosh, who is a colleague in the School of Architecture and is a partner of mine at the lab, we conduct interdis interdisciplinary research on these advanced technologies using um, state-of-the-art simulation tools. So the lab is equipped with multiple projectors, motion and infrared sensors like Kinex, uh, large screen interactive displays for augmented reality, models, physical models for projection mapping, and head-mounted displays for virtual reality virtual reality experimentation. So we've got you know, the Google Cardboard, we've got Oculus Rift, um, and a few HTC Vive, uh, HTC Vive, which is pretty amazing. 
So this, this lab space, the IDVL lab, provides a, a, a kind of experimental platform for exploring and, and reinforcing these concepts of bioresponsiveness and design. And we're doing it from different perspectives and across different scales. So I'll talk about these three research areas here at the bottom um, in a moment and how they kind of relate to this, this process and what we're getting out of it. But first, just to kind of, again, sort of position the work, the interdisciplinary collaboration here is key to, to the research. So with faculty and students from various departments at Syracuse University, we're working with research teams that include architectural designers, visual artists, mechanical engineers, material scientists, aerospace engineers, um, computer scientists, and even journalists. So it's, a, it's quite a range of um, kind of perspectives and expertise that we've had great conversations with. And you know, a, one way to kind of get everybody on the same page, you know, if you're working with a team that involves engineers and journalists and computer software programmers, it's really important that you have a kind of large objective that everyone can, can kind of uh, agree on and get motivated by. And in much of the work, these, these kind of two research questions really um, start to shape and frame, frame the research before it gets really specific. So the first one being, how can we perceive and experience our built environment in new ways to better understand the energetic relationships between our bodies, buildings, and cities? So in other words, how can we as designers utilize our strengths as kind of visionary thinkers of and managers of, managers of complexity who have a sort of intuitive understanding that our built environment express cultural and social values and that we're ultimately designing the built environment for people. And then the second question, which is how can design and visualization environments empower a wider audience with knowledge and opportunities for engagement in design decision making? So how can we weave into this design process the complexities associated with diverse human preferences and actions and behaviors? Not an easy task. So to work through these questions, I'll first present some experiments at the building envelope scale that deal with a range of kind of realities in its development. Over the last 10 years, I've been involved in the design and development of various building envelope systems that explore the transfer of emerging technologies and materials to facade applications. So I'll briefly go through one system that I've worked on for a long time. It's been a fascinating test bed and has been dri the driving force for a lot of my current research. So this building envelope system, which is called the Electroactive Dynamic Daylighting System, or EDDS, built on my doctoral research at Rensselaer and uh, CASE, the Center for Architecture, Science, and Ecology. And the idea for this patented system stemmed from transferring an information display technology to facades, where these individual metallized polymers that get embedded into the facade um, sort of act like pixels in a display screen. So this is a project that is sponsored by NYSERDA, the New York State Energy and Research Development Authority, and is in collaboration with uh, one of the industrial partners, New Visual Media Group. This is a kind of uh, zoomed in uh, explanation of how this assembly works. So um, this is sort of an exploded section of, let's say, one of these panes of glass here. So what we've got here in this kind of exploded version is basically a, a glass substrate, so it's transparent. We have a transparent fixed electrode, which is basically a, a conductive ITO, Indian tin oxide layer, a transparent dielectric layer, uh, we have some glue lines, and then we have a metallized polymer film, essentially. So that all kind of gets sandwiched together. Um, so, when we run an electric current through, let's say, the dielectric layer or the, the ITO layer, then these individually cut polymers can actually roll up and down kind of like a mini blind. And it's really rapid. They can do this within seconds. So when we start to put these two assemblies together, like a, a double pane insulated glazing unit, we can start to program these polymers to roll up and down very rapidly to either block solar radiation um, or to allow daylight through. So these are 
some more detailed sections kind of looking at this, how the system might respond over the course of one day. Um, so here in Boulder, for example, in March, on a day like today, in the morning, we might actually uh, need a little bit of passive solar heating because it's chilly in the morning, uh, we have the heat on, or we want to get as much kind of sunlight in as possible. So the system might kind of adjust its, its, uh, its, the shutter's position to allow the maximum solar radiation to come in. Whereas in the afternoon, let's say 3 o'clock, it's getting pretty warm outside, the system's going to have to adapt again because we want to start to reject some of that infrared and reject some of the heat gain. So a majority of the shutters could be then rolled down on that exterior glass surface. So it sort of it blocks the heat before it even enters the cavity. Nighttime, we might start to play with this idea of information display. So perhaps the interior lights are illuminating the facades on the inside, and we can start to imagine what, how we can start to design certain patterns or graphics or other information on the facade. Maybe in the middle of the night, the whole system shuts down because it wants to preserve some of that heat on the inside. So what's really important to note about this system is it's not a kind of on-off system. Some of you may have seen uh, systems like electrochromic glazing, where it sort of fades from clear to blue. Um, there, there are a lot of kind of systems in this family, but the aim, I think, is to really deal with not only just a, a seasonal condition, but also a diurnal condition, especially in climates where uh, you know, the temperature shift is quite radical between morning and night. So the effect, in a way, is a kind of movable frit where you can see past the polymers to maintain some kind of view, while the EDDS system is still doing the work of diffusing the glare or mitigating the solar heat gain, it can also be programmed to respond to the occupants inside the space or potentially outside the space. So it might open up for bigger views as the person approaches the window. Uh, you might get sort of morphing patterns across the facade based on different multiple users' aesthetic preferences. So it could be specifically designed for interior lighting levels, or maybe customized for individual preferences along the facade for privacy or other information display purposes. This kind of rapid and customizable response raises all sorts of complex design questions. How does user control impact energy performance? Who gets to control the pattern? How do we design these adaptive material behaviors to negotiate between environmental factors and occupant demands? So it starts to get, as you can imagine, pretty complicated, kind of messy, when we sort of put all these variables together. And just to kind of step back for a moment, this EDDS system is, is not the only one out there, right? I'm sure you guys have seen tons of kind of adaptive facade systems and technologies. So it lies within a kind of growing family of emerging uh, building facade systems that can readily respond to occupants' gestures, their proximity, <clears throat> to their preferences for view or privacy, while doing this added work of sort of blocking the heat gain when needed or allowing light to, to come through. So what's so challenging at the moment, you know, when we have these systems, some are in their early kind of fundamental stage of research, some, like the EDDS, is ready for market, right? It's, you, you just got to do a, a little bit more testing with prototypes, and that, this thing's ready for commercialization. Um, but what's really important in the kind of development of these control algorithms, in a way, is, um, you know, how do we address these questions? How do we know what the, the larger kind of visual effects will be inside a space? How do we know mo how multiple people are going to interact with it? So to prototype these systems, it's really time consuming, and it's also very expensive depending on the material. Um, and a lot of these systems are starting to deal with kind of micro or even nano scale materials like graphene or other things that, again, get really expensive and, and just hard to, to build at a large scale. You know, we might, might be lucky if we get a kind of postage stamp scale prototype or a sort of, you know, eight by eight prototype. So being able to test these materials at a full human scale becomes really important when considering how they'll perform and what their effects will be. The other problem that we're facing is that we don't really have a 3D modeling or energy software tools that can easily simulate their performance. They're simply too complex 
for commercial architectural design software to kind of handle. So this desire for user control with these systems places this added challenge to our current methods for measuring building energy performance, which largely relies on, on quantitative metrics and also relies on a certain kind of predictability, right, when we're, let's say, measuring the energy performance of a building. But what happens when these facades start to come into play? Um, and user control becomes part of that uh, sort of human behavior modeling. It gets, it gets really um, tricky. So the development of the system led to questions about how one approaches the design and the evaluation of dynamic building envelope systems. What's the relationship between people and these responsive materials? So we could no longer really rely on the quantitative methods for evaluating performance and had to develop our own. So we began programming immersive and interactive simulations that allowed us to observe and record these kind of bioresponsive feedback loops where the building materials interact with these multiple environmental and aesthetic inputs that include ambient conditions, but also these design uh, preferences from the users. So what I've been developing that began at RPI case um, and now at the IDVL, this includes teams of software engineers, material scientists, interactive artists, is this custom programmed environment sort of augmented reality space that allows us to visualize the dynamic material behaviors and the interior lighting effects of the system as it's responding to individual movements and gestures in real time. So this is one of my, uh, one of my student interns a little while back, Kurt, um, who's kind of practiced testing some of the gestures, some of the things that we've, we've programmed into the algorithm. So within the framework, Certain material parameters are pre-assigned by the architect, but the behaviors and the visual outcomes are a result of these unpredictable interactions between the solar and the occupant responsive system. So agency, in a way, is not limited to the intentional designs or actions performed by a system or by the people, but instead it starts to embody multiple things. People, material behaviors, energetic flows, and the architectural outcome is a sort of temporally emergent condition. So the simulation environment is allowing us to stage these interactions as a way of exploring how we might get along with these new materials and these dynamic surfaces, how it makes us more aware of our environment, or maybe aware of our own actions, or aware of other people's actions. And the criteria for performance doesn't rely on these quantitative benchmarks, but it's rather a kind of sort of this entanglement of the qualitative and quantitative, or the human and the non-human. So to explain a bit about how it works, the setup is actually quite simple. Um, it involves a vertical screen, spandex screen that's 10 by 18 feet. Um, there is a rear projector on the back side of the screen. There's a ceiling mounted projector that's giving us the image on the floor. And in this, in this case, we just have one connect sensor that's tracking, if you can see, it's tracking the point cloud data of the user in the space. And you might recognize this guy standing in the back here. But here we can actually capture, you know, pretty specific. So we can, we can make this a really high res point cloud and get, you know, information down to like fingers, but in this case, we're using basic arm and head and kind of body position. So to kind of return back to the diagram of the lab and just show you what, what's going on here, um, like I mentioned, that there's a actually rear projector back here that's giving us this image, ceiling mounted projector here that's giving us the floor image. There's just a, a desktop, com like gaming computer desktop that's driving the simulation. And then this is a prime sense, which is like basically a version of a connect sensor here in the corner. So uh, in a way, kind of low tech, it's, it's not a, a kind of cave environment where you've got all these expensive screens and, and projectors, and, um, but you know, the, the setup is fairly simple. The actual software and the programming is where it gets really tricky. So um, what you're seeing here is, the, uh, is a photograph of someone interacting with the screen, and on the bottom image is what we get in the monitor on the desktop. So in a, in a lot of ways, um, while Joseph here is in, this, is in the augmented reality simulation, 
um, we, can, we can look at a simulation of Joseph in the simulation. And one of my collaborators, um, who's kind of the brains behind all the interactives in the work, Lauren Covington, who is, uh, runs his, runs his um, company, Norflux, calls this the kind of inception moment where you're in the simulation, in the simulation. So in a way, this bottom image is a kind of virtual reality uh, image or a kind of hybrid reality, which gets uh, kind of interesting. So with this tool, we can also model an exterior facade. We can basically put any geometry. You can put your a rhino building in here. It could be multiple stories. And it, so it really is a kind of 3D modeling environment. This particular software environment that we're using is, is called VVVV V4. So it's kind of like Grasshopper's interface in a way where you've got nodes and uh, these kind of things. Um, but it's really meant for interactives. So one interesting component that we've programmed within the environment is this first-person perspective tracking. So you can see here, like the mullions in the glass facade are, are actually not this deep. They're just warped to match uh, Lauren's view here as he moves across the screen. So this is a video of Lauren interacting with the screen. Totally skewed space. This is my view of, I'm taking my, my kind of camera phone and recording my view of exactly what Lauren's doing. So you can kind of get a sense of how we're, we're using this first person per perspective tracking to give like a fairly accurate uh, yeah. perspective of what it might be like for the viewer. So that's my voice in the video. <laughs> um, so the sensor can track up to six people, which is when it starts to get really interesting when you uh, sort of start to collide patterns and preferences. Um, and building on uh, the work of Norflux, we're developing techniques for data collection, where we can actually document these point cloud gestures and uh, record these gestural interactions in order to analyze the tendencies and the degrees to which people might modify or adapt the, the facade's behavior. So we can start to understand how these systems negotiate potential conflicts between groups of users and demands. So what's really exciting for us is this, this sort of um, the overlay of the background patterns with um, user interactions that creates this sort of biomorphism that's emerging when these individual desires collide with maybe more collective ideals for how the skin should look or respond. And this also leads, again, to these really complex questions as designers, which is what is the role of the designer in these adaptive systems? And how does a more sort of distributed design agency inform the way that we operate as architects? I see it as my job and our, our kind of team's job um, and others who do similar work to play out these potentials because ultimately someone needs to choreograph these systems just like we do when we organize systems and program in a building. We need to play out these scenarios in order to reveal uh, the potentials but also the limitations of the systems. So one of the big objectives of the work is, is to include energy feedback in these augmented reality systems. We built in ways to calculate things like solar heat gain coefficient, uh, visible transmittance, U value in real time. So it's changed, those values are changing as the patterns are shifting. We can also um, receive real time solar radiation feedback, feedback at multiple scales. Um, so when someone's gesturing, they can understand, they can kind of get immediate feedback and maybe get a sense of, of uh, how their behaviors or position is affecting the performance of the facade. But sometimes not everybody knows what those numbers mean. Some of you might not know what those values mean, hopefully. Um, so we're looking at other ways to kind of make this data more accessible, kind of more understandable. Um, simply kind of incorporating daylight analysis grids into the environment so that the user is interacting with the facade and then we're getting some, some kind of real-time feedback as far as what that kind of solar radiation on the interior would be like. So this leads to more questions. Um, what would be, so we've got a kind of single zone analysis. It's like a, a single room. But what happens when we want to take these uh, inputs and sort of test them out at the whole building scale? So this is an area that we're working on is how to kind of make that leap between the user interacting with the system, and what might the impacts be for energy at, at, that, at the large building scale. 
Um, so we're developing different types of workflows where we can link these simulations to the whole building energy analysis software tools like Energy Plus, which maybe some of you um, are familiar with or have heard of. Again, the idea is to understand the, both the environmental and the visual impacts of this, what we call sort of live human facade interaction, but at, at multiple scales. So as we develop more patterning algorithms and gestural interactions, this is an ongoing area of work. They help us, it helps us determine how the physical prototypes should look and operate. So with prototypes being installed at RPI and CASE this, this coming spring, I'm, I'm super excited to see how this computational work and the algorithms we developed um, can influence and, and really test these prototypes in a meaningful way. So in addition to the augmented reality systems for testing uh, building envelopes, we're looking at how virtual reality or VR could also better illustrate the relationships between three-dimensional space and geometry, but also the impact of daylighting and solar heat gain. So we're continuing to develop new workflows, um, things between like Rhino, uh, Rhino plugins like Diva for Rhino, Honeybee, um, and then linking those with gaming engines like Unity 3D so we can visualize these solar energy outputs um, and see the results in a kind of virtual reality. So we've begun this work where we're starting to conduct participant studies, to get some feedback, where we're surveying students and faculty, primarily right now in architecture, a little bit in engineering. Um, some of these participants have little to no exper experience with energy modeling or even what the results look like, and some have you know, like a PhD in this area. So the goal is to explore if and how VR actually enhances one's understanding of em energy simulation data and if it has any influence on how they might uh, perceive or evaluate a space, or in this case, we're looking at uh, evaluating different facade, basic sy sy facade systems. So through kind of, um, kind of interviews and op open and closed surveys, we got a lot of really interesting feedback and found that the VR could be a really powerful tool, especially for those participants or students who had little exposure to this energy, energy simulations. Where these results can kind of be a little cryptic. Like if you get a, a pseudo color analysis grid and you're really excited to present it for your studio project, but sometimes you don't always know exactly what it means or how it informs the design process. So that's something we're trying to kind of make easier. And um, we found that some, actually a lot of the participants could better understand the meaning of the, the solar simulation results as they related to the 3D geometry, and in particular, these, th these different kind of window shading devices and systems. So, you know, obviously the graphic quality is not um, superior at this point, but we also found it pretty interesting, you know, there's a kind of shock factor when you enter into these, these virtual reality environments. And in a way, the, the, gra the kind of low res quality didn't matter. Um, they were able to sort of focus on, on the kind of the immersive space, uh, start to really look at the kind of lighting and the, these sort of three-dimensional data experiments that we're working with. So that was really um, exciting. Um, it also brought up some interesting unexpected feedback, like people started to uh, claim that they perceived different levels of glare, control, even felt sense like a warmth warm sensation, um, even though none, none of these things were actually simulated, but just sort of being able to move and navigate around the space on your own kind of evoked these other, other atmospheres, which was um, also really interesting. You can imagine if we started to actually make some of these uh, kind of temperature changes or um, acoustic qualities part of that immersive experience. So you know we're taking a lot of this feedback. It's early in, early in, in the design work, but um, really starting to incorporate this user feedback into this uh, design tool. So kind of sliding up the spectrum of scale, I'll talk um, kind of briefly about how this research is being applied at the urban scale, and also potentially impacting community design. So another area we've been working on is how to design these energy data visualizations at larger scales in order to better understand local microclimates and the relationships, again, between our bodies, um, energy use, and renewable energy resources like solar and wind. 
So there's a few different ways that we're doing this. One is through projection mapping onto physical model surfaces, where we can start to spatialize the external and dynamic solar resources in a, in a kind of localized way. And again, better understand that relationship between building geometry, surface, materials. Um, you know, how does the building orientation or its size or its thermal mass start to impact things like outdoor comfort? We can better understand the temporal characteristics of the solar and wind resource, which helps us design for these fluctuating conditions, both diurnally and seasonally. And then recognize opportunities for matching resource with demand. So basically, how and when can we harness certain types of renewable energy, like wind, to match up with and when uh, how much a building energy, how much a building needs in terms of its electricity? So this kind of visual platform starts to open up a, an interesting dialogue between the academic and neighborhood community, and also professional designers about these relationships. Um, and maybe even looking towards how they relate to architectural proposals. For example, in Syracuse, which is what we're, we're looking at here, sort of section of downtown, there's a lot of ongoing debate about um, taking down this interstate um, that kind of cuts through the downtown area. So we're really seeing visual platforms like these as ways that help us project what those conditions might be like. Um, we can also start to map out other urban data flows, things like transportation, the impact of green space on urban heat island effect, stormwater management. You can imagine there's, I mean, there's a lot of groups doing this kind of data visualization. Um, but to make it in a way that's, again, accessible and understandable for people becomes really important. We're working on a grant right now um, where the focus is actually in Austin, Texas, where we're developing visualizations that compare actual building energy use with the available energy, uh, available solar resource. So we have a smart metering system that's measuring when and how much electricity at a, a home or a building might be using and how much energy the PV system might be providing. So we're trying to identify how the solar res resource could be optimally matched. This is informing future growth of this particular community, but it's also helping us calibrate our simulation software tools like Urban Modeling Interface, UMI, maybe some of you have heard of that, Design Builder, or Energy Plus. So by, in a way, we can take the real actual data, test it, visualize it, but then use it to test our own simulation software tools, which is, is really important. Um, so again, developing these visual techniques for communicating the resource and demand to see how and when we can optimize um, these designs and the materials and the systems at a, at a more community level. So while this is just showing a kind of a zone, a, a kind of apartment building block, uh, the next step is really to look at the whole kind of community level scale and understand sort of when and how people are using um, electricity. So we're taking these ideas to a more public venue. And uh, one is our local Museum of Science and Technology, or the most. And the aim is that we can create a sort of community platform for better understanding local energy patterns, use patterns, and how to best utilize these resources. So this is an exhibit that I'm working on, again, with a group of, of collaborators, uh, Norflux, um, folks at the IDVL, Syracuse COE, and then the, the kind of museum cor uh, curators. Um, it involves large screen displays, this kind of interactive environmental data that gets mixed with projection mapping onto a scaled urban model of the city of Syracuse. So through this venue, our research is, is also kind of stepping out of this black box of the lab and more in, into a public realm. So we're establishing what we call this projective urban design laboratory. Uh, this is a recent photo of us assembling the models and calibrating the projectors and testing different data sets that get mapped on the city. And, you, you know, obviously the term projective means like a kind of literal projection of image onto a, a surface or the model in this sense. But for us, it's also a projective in a kind of future projections of where the city could go, projecting uh, in a lot of ways uh, community members, when they come and interact with the exhibit, exhibit, projecting their own ideas and inputs as well. So here's a prototype of the, 
the model um, where we're showing a LIDAR point cloud mapping of, of the downtown area of Syracuse. So we're experimenting with different ways that we can um, visualize the city, um, and then we'll be overlaying more of this kind of energy data onto both, both the kind of vertical interactive screen that we have at the lab, but also the projection modeling that will be highly interactive. So users will be able to walk up and gesture to the model, get these sort of pop-up information panels that give a sense of what that data actually means, what it means for that particular location, um, and you know other ideas that could be future proposals. Like if we had uh, rearranged this, the the buildings in a different way, if we had more parks in the space, how that might affect or impact temperature, let's say. So what's really important for us in this early stage is to establish this framework for spatializing and interacting with the data from multiple perspectives and to really get feedback from the kind of everyday users um, where a lot of this stuff impacts their everyday lives. So the exhibit's in progress, but it's shown to be a kind of draw for all ages, which is also really exciting for us, and how we can make this information not only more accessible to a wider audience, but also allow a space for community-driven design ideas where these future scenarios kind of get tested and discussed. So the hybrid reality platform allows for this sort of inception type moment where we capture this kind of scene in virtual reality. Um, we can record it, we can display it uh, on site, we can display it at the COE IDVL lab. Um, so we, we get this information that includes really valuable visitor activity and their experience with this city model. So we're kind of constantly learning from uh, mapping out these gestures and what people kind of, how they want to interact with it. Do they treat it like a smartphone or a smart screen? You know, what are the intuitive gestures that become part of this language? So again, it's anonymous point, user point cloud data that we can collect and observe and sort of analyze in terms of those, those questions. And this provides an interesting uh, lens where we can um, really investigate these patterns of use um, that might be in, in relationship to particular discussions. So let's say there's a, a group of people, uh, community stakeholders, let's say, that come to this exhibit. Um, there could be an entire conversation about design priorities or proposals and the implications that could take place through these, through these different proposals. And you sort of get an even playing field when we see the gestures and we understand ideas through these point clouds. It's a kind of, it translates into a different kind of uh, like sort of gestural speak or G-speak, um, which becomes, takes on another interesting level in how we interpret this information. So exposing this process of interaction design to a wider audience can influence the behavior of both the designers and the end users where these projective desires become part of this library of open source data. And the physical and kind of mental projections involved also start to suggest a sort of destabilizing of this kind of constant, uh, you know, predictable quantitative um, energy data that instead might result in other different imaginative urban configurations. So by testing these design and visualization tools in public settings, the kind of capacity of simulation modeling gets expanded by empowering a wider audience to better understand their local ecologies and also in sort of co-constructing these design ideas. So I'm um, incredibly honored also to be included in this month's issue of Architectural Design. The research is on the cover, which is awesome. Check it out if it's in the building or if you, you know, if you get a chance to read more about the, the research and kind of um, where it's headed. So it's, it's very exciting and it's a really interesting um, issue about uh, 4D and sort of hyper-local in general. So to kind of wrap up, um, what does this all mean for us? You know, what's, what's the, what are the kind of takeaways from this? And, you know, I see the broader impacts kind of happening on a few levels. One is that this work addresses barriers that we face right now with existing computational software tools that are currently unable or kind of really too slow at simulating a range of complex and dynamic material behaviors. Um, 
at also simulating their spatial qualities or their sort of ambient energy um, atmospheres and conditions, and how those are, are responding not only to the kind of predictable solar trajectory of the sun or wind patterns, um, but really to different visual and aesthetic preferences of, of people. The work is aiming to produce you know, a series of workflows, a series of flexible design and programming platforms that provide architects with real-time energy feedback and the spatial effects of their design choices. So trying again to kind of marry these, marry these two things together. And then it's exploring these new modes of architectural representation. So it's not only a kind of design environment or design tool, um, but also new ways that we might understand and, and read our buildings or cities in new ways. So it's translating between kind of energy data, projection, um, and then different scales in the built environment. So really experimenting with these imaginative potentials of projective space. So thank you very much uh, for, for coming tonight, and I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thanks. Thank you.